Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We're asking, Lord, you open the pages of the scriptures for everyone. Amen. Help us to see, Amen. to understand, Amen. to believe, Amen. to apply the word in our hearts, Amen. and to reach forth unto other people in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 9. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to notice that, called to the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 4. It says, Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. The fellowship that leads to our ministering to the saints. You see what we read in chapter 1, verse 9. Fellowship of the Son. Here we have fellowship of the saints. We are coming to First John, chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 3. First John, chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen. Here is an apostle talking. He is a servant of God. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That ye also may have fellowship with us, us the apostles, us the servants of God. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. As you look at those three verses of scriptures we have read, you find the mention of the word fellowship. And it says we are called to fellowship with the Father, with the Son, also with the saints of God and the servants of God. Tonight, as we look at those verses, we are looking at the divine call to true fellowship. The divine call. He calls us. God calls us. The Father himself calls us, and he calls us to fellowship with his Son. It's a call by God, and it is a command from God. As we have read, we're called into fellowship with the Son, with the saints, and with his servants, the servants of God. One, you can talk about the transforming fellowship with the Son. You come to the Son in repentance. You come to the Son as Savior. And you come to the Son and you're in fellowship with Him, relationship with Him. It transforms your life. Transforming fellowship with the Son. The second thing is the true fellowship with the saints. You're brought into the assembly of the children of God. Brought into the congregation of the saints of God. And as you come into that fellowship and congregation and assembly, you are in fellowship with all the believers of like precious faith, like yourself. But then, we fellowship with the servants of God, or the apostles of the Lord, or the preachers of the gospel, or the pastors in the churches. And this is trustworthy fellowship with the servants. We think of fellowship like a two-way traffic. It's not just that you are receiving, you are getting, you are giving. You are responding, you are receiving. You are blessing and you are benefiting. That is, as you have fellowship with the saints, they give to you, you give to them. You get, you give. As you have fellowship with the ministers of God, you are receiving from them, you are responding to them. It's a two-way thing. It's not just that I'm a part of the church. 
And because I'm a part of the church, I'm in fellowship with the people, and they're feeding me, they're helping me, and they're taking care of me. And that's what I think is fellowship. Isn't it wonderful when in this fellowship? That, you know, when I'm sick, they come to me, they pray with me. And they come to me, they share with me. They come to me, they read the Bible to me. And I'm never giving anything back. That's not fellowship. Fellowship is a two-way thing. And we think of the Son of God. He's giving us quite a lot of things. And he's giving us everything we've got. And if we're in fellowship with him, we must give something back to him. We get from him, we give to him. The same thing with the saints of God, the saints in the assembly, in the church of the living God, we're getting from them, we're giving unto them. And the same thing with the servants of God, we're getting from them, we're giving unto them. In our fellowship with the Son, look at this, we feed on his word. That's the F in the fellowship there. We embrace his will. You cannot say you are fellowship with the Son of God or Jesus Christ and you don't feed on his word. That's the basis of the fellowship with him. And then to embrace his will. To love, that's the end in the fellowship there. We love his word. We just love that word. It's always speaking, feed us more and more with this word. We learn his ways. Because we're in fellowship with him, he's giving to us, and then we're learning, and we're eager to learn of his ways. We obey his word. That's fellowship. Fellowship with the Lord. Fellowship with Christ. As he's giving to us, as he's teaching us the word, we're obeying his word. We withdraw from the wolves. Withdraw from the wolves because he is the true shepherd. And he is the one guiding us. And because of the shepherd, we're withdrawing ourselves from the wolves. Not only that, we seek his wisdom. This is the one wiser than Solomon. And wiser than anybody that had ever been. And we have his word, we have his wisdom. In the New Testament, we're seeking his wisdom. H is to help in his work. We're fellowship with him. He's giving us... And we're getting, and we have to give something back. We have to consecrate. We have to yield our lives to him. And because of that, we're helping in his work. We increase in his witness. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And here we are now, and we're fellowship with him. Therefore, we are witnesses of the Lord. We're increasing the time we give to witnessing. We're increasing the passion we give to witnessing. We increase in his witness. P, we praise his worthiness. It's worthy. Worthy to be praised. And it's worthy to receive all glory, all honor. And therefore, our lives are spent in praising the Lord. Fellowship with the Son. But now, we're also fellowship with the saints of God. Here we are in the household of faith. Here we are with the children of God. And it says, we're in fellowship with the saints. We're in fellowship with the children of God. What does that mean if we forgive and we forbear? Many things will happen in the fellowship. Many things will happen in the congregation. Many things happen between us and the children of God. If we're in true fellowship, we forgive, we forbear. We edify one another. That's fellowship. You edify him. He edifies you. And you're sharing together. You're sharing the word of God together. Testimonies together. Encouragement together. Makes you to edify one another. L in the fellowship there is that we love one another. We lift up one another. That Jesus is down and you happen to be up at this time. And therefore you lift him up. That's part of the fellowship. It's sorrowful. You lift him up. It's discouraged. You lift him up. Anything is, is happening, a problem in his life, you're lifting him up. You observe. You observe one another. He doesn't have to come and tell you, I'm down, you're observing. I'm sick, you're observing. I'm sorrowful, you're observing. In fellowship, we're not just going our way. You go your way, I go my way. And we don't know what's happening to our fellow brother, our fellow sister. We observe one another. We want one another. Uh, our brother is not, uh, you know, doing well. Uh, fellowship is not smiling all the time. Fellowship is not just a well, God bless you, 
That's all right. Whatever is happening, that's all right. No, we one one another. Yes, we serve one another. We serve in love. We serve by faith. We serve with everything we've got, and we serve one another. Each we help one another. And also, as we think of this a fellowship, we intercede. We are interceding for each other. There are problems. You don't have to be in the prayer warrior to pray for another person. Because of a fellowship, we intercede for one another. P, we please one another. Uh, maybe you, you didn't uh, understand that before. L think of that before. Let me look at this in Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 1. Pleasing one another. It says in uh, Romans chapter 15 verse 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. In fellowship, we're not thinking of ourselves. This is what I want. This is what I like. This is what I desire. This is the way I want things to go. No. You're thinking of the other person. Look at verse 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. And that's the fellowship we're talking about. You forgive and forbear. You edify. You love. You lift up. You observe. You warn. You serve. You help. You intercede. And you please one another. As we think about fellowship with the saints, if there is no fear in fellowship, you see, if you fear another person, and then there's something going wrong there. And the, the, the two-way communication of the mercy of God, of the love of God, is not flowing freely if there's no fear. E, there is no envy in fellowship. L, there is no lying. We don't lie to each other. You're in fellowship. You're transparent. And because you're in fellowship, there is no lying. There is no lust. There is no oppression in fellowship and there is uh, no warfare we're not fighting there's no conflict there's no strife when there is real fellowship and then uh, there is no slander if you're fellowshipping with somebody he might tell you something about his life might tell you something about his family might tell you something about uh, you know uh, let's we you need to pray for, with me my sister because my my husband is uh, you know going this way and that way and then we don't take that prayer point and then go and tell another person because of fellowship there's no slander and then whatever we know of other people we're not broadcasting that we're not uh, you know putting that on the net on the social media this happening to such and such and such and such there's no slander there's no hypocrisy in fellowship we don't uh, deal with each other hypocritically as if uh, you know i love him but really in my heart there's no real love and there's no ill will ill will is ill feeling ill will is you know some secret hatred there and then there is no pride we're talking of fellowship among the saints and there's no fear there's no envy there's no lying there's no lust there's no oppression there's no warfare there's no slander there's no hypocrisy there's no ill will there's no pride now as we think about fellowship of the servants of god and when i talk of servants of god i think you need to now reset your mind because sometimes when we say pastor pastor they're referring to gs almost all the time you understand you have a local pastor there in your district and it's the servant of god and you need to be in fellowship with him and then we have in uh, you know the city we have a group pastors and the group pastors say uh, our district pastors are looking up to the group pastors all our workers are looking up to the group pastors all our members are looking up to the pastors to the group pastor in that group and so as we refer to the servant of god we're referring to those leaders over us if we're in the region the region overseer is a pastor there is the pastor over the whole region of course we have pastors over the local government so we're not referring to just one person now in the church that somebody is always referring to 
pray for the pastor, pray for the pastor. That's all right. And he's also a pastor. And everything we're talking about now, this applies to the leaders and our sisters to our mothers in the Lord are also pastors in this sense we are talking about now because they are the handmaids of the Lord and the servants of the Lord and they are watching over a group of people in a children church to you. the same thing the servants of God were referring to those are servants of God over those young people those children the youth section the campus section every section among our ushers and among our security and the choir and our full-time workers and those who are doing one thing or the other we have servants of God over us and what the Lord is saying is that we should have fellowship with the servants of God and because this idea is not uh, clear to many many people I'm going to now read the scripture so that you understand the fellowship we're talking about we may know the Greek somebody says uh, the Greek word is kononia I hear you somebody says uh, fellowship means that you know there is unity I hear you somebody says there's humility in fellowship I hear you all that is true how do we have the items of the fellowship that I will know that you are in fellowship with me I'm in fellowship with you and that your leader will know in the locality there that you are in fellowship with him if we follow him we follow that leader you know if you if you have a leader you like a group pastor that taught tonight is a servant of God and in his group maybe you never have any relationship with him and you don't even know his pattern of life and you don't know his understanding you don't know his expectation so you cannot say you're in fellowship with him you can stand on the pulpit there and talk to you but you don't know what he wants you don't know what he desires to follow you follow that leader that's the very beginning of that fellowship i'm looking at this in uh, hebrews chapter 13 hebrews chapter 13 i read from verse 7 it says remember them which have the rule over you them is not talking of the gs it's talking of the servant of god and what many of us here them in the plural remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of god whose face tell me the next word there follow considering the end of their conversation if you don't know about their faith you don't know about their faithfulness you don't know about their dedication to the will of god the word of god you don't you don't know about their testimony how do you fellowship with them there's no fellowship we just talk about you know we're in fellowship together if we follow the servant of god he esteem them esteem them we're looking at first thessalonians chapter 5 first thessalonians chapter 5 and i'm reading here from verse 12 and verse 13 i will beseech you brethren to know them plural not just him not just the gs to know them which labor among you and over you in the lord and admonish you and to tell me the word there esteem them very highly esteem the servant of god very highly if you esteem somebody you're not going to be looking down on them you're not going to be playing pranks of them you're not going to be doing anything that will provoke them or hinder their ministry you esteem them l you love them you love them it's something practical and it tells us in that verse 13 to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves so we follow them that's fellowship with the leader we esteem them that's fellowship with the leader we love them that's fellowship with the leader we learn from them we learn from them a leader has stood up to preach a leader has stood up to say something we don't close our bibles and say when the gs comes on i will i will listen they don't have anything to teach me it's your leader and if we say we're fellowshipping with our leaders we're fellowshipping with the servants of god we must learn from them i know you are learning from them i'm just making illustration are there learners there today you keep on learning in jesus name 
you never despise any leader. You never despise the servants of God. Some of the servants of God are more evangelistic than their teachers. Some of the servants of God are more of a teacher than an evangelist. Some of the servants of God are more of a pastor than a teacher. Those are different gifts and those are different skills. But the word of God it says that we must learn from them. Sometimes it, a leader is not even talking. He's just sitting there quietly. You learn about his humility. You learn about his conduct, his area of life. You learn about his wisdom. His wisdom. Sometimes a leader is, you know, getting old. And because he's getting old, he cannot run fast like you are running. But you understand, he has experience deep experience is gone through many things in life and just listening to him not listening on the pulpit you go to him and then he gives you counsel we can learn i pray you will learn yeah. philippians chapter 4 and i'm reading here from verse 9 the philippians chapter 4 we're reading from verse 9 it says those things which he have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. Amen. I thought there'll be a good amen. amen. We learn, we learn from the servant of God and we obey the servants of God. It will be a pity if uh, you know any of the servants of God they talk to you and they say this is what to do. And you see from the scriptures, they'll say, no, until I hear from so-and-so. Until I hear from, you know, the man up there. How about the leader there? How about the servant of God there? Paul was not the only apostle. And Paul was not the only leader in the early church. There were other leaders too. And we need to listen to the servants of God. And we need to obey them. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 17. Verse 17, it says, what's the first word over here? I can't hear my people. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account and that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you is saying that we should obey our leaders our the servants of god that's the fellowship we're talking about in fellowship we follow them in fellowship, we esteem them. In fellowship, we love them. In fellowship, we learn from them. In fellowship, we obey them. In fellowship, we walk like them. We walk with them. That he is uh, moving and making progress like them. You won't say, well, we don't understand. It's just running too fast and let him keep on running. I, I can't run like that. Why, why does this say slow down? You have to catch up. And you are to walk with them. Walk with that servant of God. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. Here now, Paul is now particular. And Paul is, uh, you know, Paul did not uh, shy away from the very fact that God has chosen me to be a leader and a servant of God. And if he's to be a servant of God, a leader to the people, he must uh, show an example. And now he says, be followers together of me and mark them. He's saying, I'm not the only one, but I'm one of them. But mark them which walk as she have was for an example. That's why leaders are there. That's why the servants of God are there. Fellowship with them means we're walking like them. Yes, we stand with them. We stand with them. You stand with the leader. The leader, the servant of God, is having a challenge. Well, he is, uh, he is a great leader, a great man of faith. He can pray. He's a great man of faith. God will supply his, uh, all his needs. He's a great man that has experience. We don't have to support him. We don't have to stay with him. We don't have to stand by him because he can stand. That man, that woman, that woman, woman of God can stand by herself. That's no fellowship. When we leave them isolated, we leave them with all their problems and we leave them with all their challenges. Fellowship means that we stand with them. Look at what Paul the Apostle is saying in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
second timothy chapter 4 and i'm reading here from verse 16 second timothy chapter 4 verse 16 at my first answer no man stood with me you can tell from the language he was expecting somebody will come and stand with me here and stand by me here i'm going through thick and thin i'm going through some challenges and i've been running around i'm preaching here i'm preaching there i'm preaching everywhere and none of these people even stood with me he said at my first answer no man stood with me but all men forsook me i pray god that it may not be laid to their charge notwithstanding notwithstanding the lord stood with me the lord will stand with you he will stand by you in Jesus' name. And strengthened me. That's what you expected. That the people will come. They know that, you know, he was being charged for whatever. Because of what he had been doing. The preaching of the word of God. They didn't stand with him. But he said, thank God, the Lord stood with me. And um, F, what is F? I'm starting again. I'll follow them. E, what is that? L, what is that? And L, the next L. O, what is that? W. And S. H is to honor them. Honor them. We honor them. You know, if you honor somebody, you're not going to be talking about his wife in a derogatory manner. If you honor somebody, you're not going to be talking about his children in a derogatory manner. If you honor somebody, a, a woman leader, a servant of God, but a woman, you're not going to be talking about her and about her, maybe about whatever it concerns her in any derogatory manner because we love them and we honor them and let me tell you this i don't mean any bad thing to anybody but you know uh, we we had the children in the church and now here is the leader he spent all his life serving us he spent everything he left everything and he's serving us and now his uh, children are going to get uh, married and the child comes and he says i see the will of god and the father and the mother who are also leaders in the church they're so they're so nice that they don't want to get involved they say go through the church process and they get there to the marriage committee and we do, we cannot feel that this is a, you know pastor's daughter this is a pastor's a, you know son and then we question we drill and everything don't think because your father is uh, you know a preacher and a pastor here that you are going to just find it easy in fact if anybody finds it tough you will find it tough what's the matter you want to drive him away from the church there's no sympathy at all we're not even thinking about the sacrifice of the father and the mother we must honor them we must honor them we feel for them and we feel with them if your own child went to the marriage committee and they wanted uh, you know to be dealt with would you deal with your own child like that we must have understanding that these servants of god that fellowship with them means that we're concerned about what concerns them and whatever concerns them we're going to take it very serious if we have made mistakes in the past because we are careless about our fellowship with our leaders from today think things are going to change look at first timothy chapter 5 and i'm reading from verse 17 first timothy chapter 5 verse 17 let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor we honor all the other people in the church we honor the workers we honor a uh, people but there are people that have sunk their very life into the service of god and their leaders their leaders and their servants of god fellowship with them means sometimes we even call them well you know if you have chance to talk to them i hope everything is all right i hope you are getting on well and all that that you can have pro times of discouragement moses had times of discouragement joshua had his own time he fell on his face and paul the apostle said fears within and fightings without he had his own challenges and peter had his own time of imprisonment and all those problems we should have contact with them and fellowship with them it says let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine i inform them 
Inform them. Do you know there are people that, you know, if you're in fellowship together, there'll be information up and down. Your child is getting married, inform your the servant of God who is over you. And, uh, you know, something is happening in your family or a challenge or whatever. You're traveling to your village, you're traveling somewhere, you're even traveling overseas, you're traveling somewhere, you will inform the servant of God who is over you there. And, uh, you know, anything that is happening, a problem in the church, you inform them, something good is happening, you inform them, they would even know that the work they are doing for the Lord is bearing fruit. It will bring joy to their heart. But something good is happening, we don't inform them, and uh, you know, something exciting and happy, and uh, you know, the benefit of the work they are doing, the thing is progressing, we don't inform them. Anytime there's problem, anytime something is you know, going wrong, then we run to them and say, sir, there's problem. You think you are serving God. But I'm telling you that, you know, this thing, everything is collapsing. When things were good, no information. Testimonies, no information. Something encouraging, no information. It's only when things are bad, there's information. I think things will change. Yeah. You'll be carriers of good news. Yeah. Bearers of good news in Jesus' name. Something that will not give you the servant of God laboring over you hypertension. Something that will not give them depression or stress, but you come and you're always sharing something good. And some when they happen, you share them. But when when other bad things happen to you, you share them. You're not holding anything back. That is the two-way traffic and the communication with the people of God. We're looking at uh, First Corinthians chapter one, and I'm reading from verse eleven. First Corinthians chapter one, verse eleven. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Proper information. P, we pray for them. We pray for them. You know, some people think that leaders are so strong, we don't pray for them. Our, the servants of God are so strong, we don't pray for them. The sectional leaders in various areas of work are so strong, we don't need to pray for them. Of course we do. Of course we do. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us, servants of God. We need prayer. Pray for us, the apostles. We need prayer. Pray for us. We're sectional leaders. Pray for us. And sometimes we do our best. And what comes out is does not show that we're giving our best to the work. But all the same, pray for us. Brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you. That we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. You can see as we look at the word of God that number Number one, we have fellowship with the Son. That is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, we have fellowship with um, the saints of God. Number three, we have fellowship with the servants of God. Now I come to divide the message to three parts. Number one, the beginning and the building up of true fellowship. The beginning and the building up of true fellowship. Point number two, the boundary and the blockages against true fellowship. There are boundaries that, uh, you know, are set in the word of God concerning fellowship. And there are blockages to true fellowship. The boundary and the blockages against true fellowship. Number three, the backbone and the bond of true fellowship. The backbone of true fellowship and the bond of true fellowship. Number one, what's number one? The beginning of the building up. You cannot build it up if you have not started it. There must be a commencement. There must be a beginning. The beginning and the building up of true fellowship. Let's look at uh, First Corinthians again. First Corinthians chapter one, and I'm reading from verse nine. First Corinthians chapter one. We're reading from verse nine. It says, "God is faithful." by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son jesus christ our lord it says it is god himself that calls us 
into the fellowship of his son. How does he do that? He sends the word to us, the word of repentance. How does he do that? He sends a preacher to us. He sends a soul winner to us. And then the word reaches us and we realize we are sinners. We realize we are dead in sins and trespasses. And then we repent and we call on the name of the Lord and we are saved and we are brought now into union with Christ. Relationship with Christ and fellowship with Christ. That is salvation. We're coming to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I read from verse 17. John 17 verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now the Lord Jesus Christ was praying for the people who already saved. And he's praying for them to be sanctified. Why? So that, look at verse 21. That they all may be one as thou father art in me. And I in thee. And that and that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Sanctification deepens a fellowship. It, it makes our hearts more tender. It, it, it removes the Adamic nature. It removes the depravity. And then fellowship becomes really deeper than what it was. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 15. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 reading from verse 15 and as I began to speak the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning then remembered I the word of the Lord how that he said John indeed baptized with water but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost this is the baptism of the Holy Ghost for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I could withstand God? You see, before this time, there's not really good fellowship between Peter and the house of Cornelius. It's like, well, the Lord is compelling me to go there and I'm going there and I'm going to preach. And he started preaching, but he started preaching as a visiting preacher. He started preaching as a foreign preacher. He started preaching as somebody coming from the Jews and these were Gentiles. And then those people received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Everything changed. Unity came. Togetherness came. Oneness came. He said, the same gift was received. The same Holy Ghost baptism was received. God has given to these people and there was unity among them, fellowship among them. And when Peter returned to the believers in Jerusalem and he said, what have you done? You've gone to those Gentiles, you ate with them, your fellowship with them. He said, you know what? Those people are the same baptism in the Holy Ghost. What are we talking about? Salvation brings us in. Sanctification gets us deeper. The Holy Ghost baptism also aids us to have deeper and richer and the tighter fellowship together. And then after that has happened, now we build up that fellowship. It has begun already because we are saved. It has begun already because we are sanctified. It has begun already because we are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And now we build it up, build it up, build it up. In John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 34. John chapter 13 verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another love one another love one another and it's not theoretical practical practical how do you show love you do to others as you want them to do unto you he needs something and you have you don't have to say i'm going to go to our pastor i'm going to go to our group pastor and take permission before i can give them the thing that they need if you are there and you had that need and another person had something to supply you want them to come and supply that thing immediately. The same thing. We should be prompt in attending to the needs of other people. We should be prompt in attending to the challenges in the lives of other people. And sometimes we might even feel some discomfort because uh, maybe you've been you are tired and you want to rest, and somebody is knocking at the door. What's the matter at this time? They're knocking at my door. We're talking of fellowship now because of love. You will get up, and when you get up, it's not like okay 
what do you want at this hour? What do you want at this time? You turn it around. If it were yourself and you wanted attention at this time, something must be very serious to bring this man, to bring this sister at this time. You attend to them. It may not be comfortable for you, but by the grace of God, we'll do it. Yeah. I said, we'll do it. He said that we love one another as I have loved you, that she also love one another. How do we love one another? As, tell me out loud, as Christ has loved us. He knows we can do it. That's why he has told us to do it. You can do it. You will do it. I said you will do it. Look at verse 35. By day shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved toward one another love toward one another the foundation of true fellowship is the experience of genuine salvation the dead cannot fellowship with the living darkness cannot fellowship with the light demons and satan cannot fellowship with christ cults cannot fellowship with the church Human depravity cannot fellowship with heavenly divinity. The Canaanites cannot fellowship with the true Israelites. And sinners and backsliders cannot fellowship with saints and believers. After that beginning of the fellowship, after that beginning that we are called to salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, now we move on and we love one another. We are looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and here we're reading from verse 10 and verse, uh, verse 16. In verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Kindly affection. You are kind to people. Don't be cruel to people. You see, sometimes the way you will snub people, the way we look down on them, uh, they feel as if they are less than human beings. But when you give them attention, when you affection, it when you show love when you pay attention to them and you pay attention to their needs that's the fellowship the lord is talking about and it says in honor preferring one another in honor preferring one another look at something that brother that sister can do that you cannot do look at something that uh, that brother is very good at that uh, you are not good at and he might also look at you and find something you are good at that he is not good at as we look at each other like that and we prefer I prefer him and then I give him chance and we start in little little things a uh, two of us want to go out uh, throw the door and I say I, I'll come after you oh the person said no I will come after you and then eventually one of us uh, will go along that is preferring other people. There is an opportunity. There is a chance uh, where to go for missions, for example, in our various uh, groups. And then the, I am available. I want to go. He is available. He wants to go. And he, the only chance he has in his place of work is at this time that he can go. I say, my brother, you can go. I'll go another time. And the other brother says, well, you are, I, I think you're a better teacher than myself. And over there, the need somebody that can really teach no uh, god will help you i'll be praying along with you we give each other's chance so that the work of god will prosper in our hands together in jesus name look at verse 16 look at verse 16 it says be of the same mind one toward another of the same mind one toward another there's no competition there's no criticism and there's no inner kind of strife or warfare with each other. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. I pray God will give us all that we need so that by the grace of God we'll serve each other. I said we'll serve each other. You'll, you'll think of other people. What can I do for him that he cannot do for himself? What can I do for her that she cannot do for herself? We're looking at Galatians chapter 5 and I'm reading from verse 13. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love. What do we do? 
serve one another by love serve one another and that means uh, you're not sitting down all the time that you know other people are serving you there are times they also should sit down and you are serving them serve one another you give us this let me give this one and you went you keep this direction let me come the direction that means we're serving one another we're helping one another we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4 I read verses 2 and 3 Ephesians chapter 4 we're reading verses 2 and 3 it says without lowliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love forbearing one another in love now sometimes uh, people may be doing things they are not conscious of for example uh, we are you know in a fellowship and then we ask a question somebody stands up and picks the microphone the person teaching has not even said uh, okay you can answer but you know he, he so lost the word of god and he wants to uh, you know say something what he says may not be the you know the most deep and you know the most significant thing but you know he's happy doing that with we'll forbear and then another another question comes and the same brother is you know raising the hand and before we cut him he's already there Maybe it's, it's just, you know, happy that he, I backslid before. Something happened before, but now I'm in the Lord and I'm, I'm going to give everything I have to the Lord. And temporarily, he forgot that the rest of us are there. We too want to serve the Lord. Allow him, allow him. Let him have his time. It's his time to be happy and to be joyful and to be contribute, to contribute like this. Don't condemn him. You don't understand why he's doing like that. You don't understand. We forbear. There are things we may not agree with it's not sinful it's not sinful it's just that this is what he does at this time and this is what she's doing at this time and you know sometimes there may even be a direct mistake like for example you you know that if somebody has uh, done something is dressing a particular way and you're wondering why is she dressing like that why is this like that why is it like that don't uh, don't be forward i don't just go to her and say hey come on look at this i thought you were I don't talk like that. What happened today? If you discuss with her very well, you might understand why she's putting on that kind of dress and we forbear with one another. There are some idiosyncrasies, there are some peculiarities of people. You are patient, you are patient. And as we are patient, the Lord, there are times God will wash all those things away. And then we, but we don't allow that to bug us now and then we cannot move forward. Thank God we're moving forward. Amen. I said we're forward-looking people. Amen. We're not going to allow this things to bother us. We will not uh, destroy the work of God because of some of these little, little things. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In the bond of peace. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. Look at verse uh, 31. It says, let all bitterness and uh, wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as god for christ's sake has forgiven you god will give us grace i come to point number two the boundary and the blockages against true fellowship the boundary and the blockages against true fellowship that means that god sets the boundary and the boundary says we must honor what kind of boundary is this ephesians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 11 ephesians chapter 5 from verse 11 and have no fellowship with the fruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them that's the boundary I said. And this is a command of God. It's not something you can say, no, I don't accept that. We must accept everything. The totality of the word of God. And it says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in a secret. First Corinthians chapter 10, the boundary that the word of God has said that God himself has said around the fellowship of the children of God. First Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils 
and not to God. And I would not that she should have fellowship with devils. That is, uh, all those unbelievers, they sacrifice, they do it in ignorance perhaps, or they do it because that's their tradition. But it says we must not be partakers with them, we must not share with them in those uh, sacrifices and works of darkness. It says in verse 21, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. We must be very clear in our mind that we're not encouraging uh, um, false religion. We're not encouraging idolatry. We're not encouraging powers of darkness or societies of darkness. In um, First Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 11, the boundaries that God has set and the blockages against uh, true fellowship and will block these things away from our fellowship. It says in First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, but now I have reached unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, an idolater, a railer, a drunkard, an extortioner, will such and one know not to eat. You see the boundary there? You see, somebody says he's a believer, but he's living a backsliding life, a sinful life, and he's, he's uh, into fornication, and he's not even repenting, and he's not a feeling that he's doing anything wrong, or he's covetous, or he's an idolater, or he's a railer. In our meeting like this, you can, you know, get up and shout another person down, and the bully on somebody, and then the ushers and the leaders try to calm him down. Leave me alone, leave me alone. You see that the way there's no evidence of salvation in that person's life it says we should not encourage such people and be in fellowship with such people it tells us in first john chapter one first john chapter one reading from verse five in first john chapter one verse five this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all amen if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. If we say we're in fellowship with God, you know some people, if you're trying to correct them about something, they say you are the one that saw it like that. I know that I'm in fellowship with God. And yet, you know, he's walking in darkness. It says if we say we have fellowship with him and we're walking in darkness, we'll lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we are walking in the light, we're living straight. We're living the normal Christian life. And uh, if there's any mistake, we'll correct the mistake. If there's any carelessness, we go to the Lord in prayer. And the Lord cleanses us and, you know, gets us back on our feet. He says, that's all right. But if somebody is deliberately walking in darkness, and he's not going to receive correction. He says, that's not right. But we're walking in the light. I see it's in the light. We have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth us from all sin he'll cleanse us and will not remain in anything that is evil in jesus name we're coming to the old testament in second chronicles second chronicles chapter 19 second chronicles chapter 19 we're reading from verse 2 the boundary around true fellowship that we shouldn't cross that line and then allow ourselves to be so sentimental that we're in fellowship with almost every dick and harry. It says in Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 2. And Jehu the son of Ananiah, the seer, that's the prophet, went out to meet him, that's to meet Jehoshaphat, and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? and love them that hate the Lord. You see, the people who are ungodly, the people who are righteous, the people who are sinners, we don't help them. That is, we don't know that we can give them food and give them water and give them some things, but we don't bring them into fellowship as if, yes, you are my brother, yes, you are my sister, and uh, our army will go with your army, our workers will go with your workers. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? 
therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Judgment came upon Jehoshaphat because he was in fellowship with Ahab. You'll not be in fellowship with the Canaanites. You'll not be in fellowship with the Jebusites. You'll not be in fellowship with the Egyptians. You will keep the line very clear. And then unless they repent and turn to the Lord, then you are not going to be in fellowship with them. Psalm 94, we're reading from verse 20. Psalm 94, we're reading from verse 20. Psalm 94, verse 20. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? There are people that sit on the judgment seat. There are people that make laws. And the laws are to destroy the people of God. And they are to destroy the way and the gospel, the grace of God. They sit on the throne and on the throne of authority. And they, they are doing evil. And they are making laws that will destroy the work of God. You are not being in fellowship with such people. No matter the consequence of the cause. He says, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? Which frame mischief by a law they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous they're on the throne they're in authority and they gather themselves or against the soul of the righteous and they condemn the innocent blood you will not have fellowship with such in jesus name the true disciple is a saved soul a real follower of Jesus Christ. He cannot, he will not have fellowship. He will not maintain fellowship with anyone, with any group of people, with any assembly involved in idolatry, involved in syncretism. That is a little Bible, a little tradition, a little occultism. You will not have fellowship with all that. Always the people that are involved with fornication or adultery or hypocrisy or apostasy or false doctrine or occultism or wickedness or darkness in any way. The Lord will keep us safe and sound in the will of God and the word of God in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the backbone. And the bond of true fellowship. The backbone and the bond of true fellowship. How do we have real fellowship together? The word of God makes us understand. When we talk of the backbone, you understand when a man is standing, when a woman is standing, any human being, the, the bones you have, the bone structure you have at your back that keeps you straight, you can stand like this, that's the backbone. If the backbone is not there and the, all the other parts are there, you cannot stand and you cannot live like a real man, like a real human being. But when the backbone is in place, the same thing with fellowship, when the backbone is in place, place then you're able to do everything you ought to do we're looking at leviticus chapter 6 leviticus chapter 6 the backbone of fellowship fellowship in the family has a backbone fellowship in the flock of god has a backbone fellowship in society has a backbone fellowship in our places of work has a backbone fellowship anywhere in our local churches in our district churches in our groups of churches in our local government and in our state fellowship as a backbone we're looking at leviticus chapter 6 and verse 2 if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the lord and lie to his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep all in fellowship you see that somebody has been in fellowship with another person has been in fellowship with the assembly of the people of god and now he's uh, he's done something wrong in fellowship or anything taken away by violence or has deceived his neighbor or has found that which was lost and lies concerning it, and sweareth falsely in any of all these that a man doeth sinning therein. Then it shall be, because he has sinned, and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, and the thing which he has deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found. 
and all that about which he has sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle, and shall add the fit part more thereto, and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. And the message is very clear. You're in fellowship, and because we trusted each other, I trust you, you trust me, and then our brothers and sisters will trust each other because we're in fellowship. And now, at the time of temptation, you stole something from the fellowship. At the time of temptation, you did something and you fell, and you didn't stand according to the word of God. And it's not just fellowship, fellowship. If we're going to keep the fellowship, here is the backbone. You will make restitution. The things you have stolen, you will restore. The lies you have told, you'll correct the lie. And the things you did to disturb the fellowship, to destroy the fellowship, you're going to correct that thing. That's what the Old Testament is telling us, and that's the Bible. And Jesus said the same thing in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 23. You know, if somebody doesn't want to do this, there's no evidence of salvation. When you are saved, when you're a real child of God, and you know you've stolen something, or you backslid, you've stolen something, or you've done something that you shouldn't have done, you make correction. You make restitution. If you have grace, it will be done. If you're not doing it, it's because there's no grace. You don't want to hear about correction. You don't want to hear about restitution. You don't want to hear about righteousness. It's because there's no grace. If the grace of God is there, now you are prayed and God has forgiven you. And things are totally different now. And you don't have the mind of continuing to do that wrong thing. You know? Then you make restitution. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 23. Matthew chapter 5 verse 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and dear remembrance that thy brother has ought against thee, it may be like, you know, you're a woman, and then you're going to offer your service, your singing to the Lord, and then you remember that your fellowship at home is not right. Your husband is not happy. And your husband is just there saying, the church does not know this woman. If the church knew this woman, they won't even allow her to stand there and be singing. You will come Correct that thing with your husband. You have humility and you have tenderness. And then you go to your husband, I'm sorry about this. I don't know what came upon me that I did that. And then everything is settled. Then you can go on and offer your gift. But the people that you walk anyhow and talk anyhow and act anyhow, and they don't know that anybody is offended or anybody is being hurt, and they keep on doing the evil thing they're doing, and they think that it doesn't matter what, what matters is my gift and my skill and my ability. I'm just going to offer that. That's not Christianity. In fellowship, we correct all those things that are wrong and then we make restitution. I'm going to read that verse 23 again. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there remembrest that thy brother has to out against thee, leave thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift gift. Restitution is necessary. We're looking at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 3. Luke chapter 17 verse 3. It says, take it yourselves if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if you repent, forgive him. You see there, it says in our fellowship, relationship together, you might offend your brother, you might offend your sister. And it says, take it to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee. Don't keep malice. Don't just hold it in. I won't talk. If I talk now, they will misunderstand me. And they think I'm complaining. And they think I'm the one that has problem. It's always complaining. It's always talking don't mind him so i'm going to keep quiet say no you can't do that it says if we're going to keep the fellowship here is the backbone of the fellowship it says rebuke him tell him this is wrong tell him how could you do this tell him it's not the right way tell him a believer shouldn't act this way tell him you have hurt me you shouldn't do this to me then he says if he repents if he argues you know there are people are talking about forgiveness forgiveness they don't understand the backbone of fellowship what they mean by forgiveness is somebody has done something wrong just okay i forgive no repentance and they repeat that same thing i forgive no repentance and they do that same dumb thing i forgive 
That's not the Bible. Look at what Jesus said. He said, take it yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. And then he says, look at verse 4. If he trespass against thee, tell me, seven times in a day, and then tell me what follows. Seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, and repent. That's important. That's important. In fellowship, there must be repentance. You cannot just keep on stepping on somebody's toes every time and say, well, we're Christians, forgive me. And then you slap them, we're Christians, forgive me. You cheat them, we're Christians, forgive me. You're working in their company, you're working in their business, you're teaching in their school, and then you're doing some lousy work and you're doing some things that are not right. We're Christians, just forgive me. And you keep on doing nothing. That's no fellowship. We're, we're condoning sin. We're condoning evil. It says, when they talk, come to you, seven times a day, they have the humility to say, I don't know why I'm like this. You must pray for me. I'm sorry about this. I blew it again. I shouldn't have done that. Look at what I've done now. And you see genuine repentance. It says, thou shalt forgive him. I pray God will give us understanding in Jesus' name. We're looking at James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 16. James chapter 5 we're reading from verse 16. And now there are people that put all the emphasis on prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Look at chapter 5 verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that she may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see, look up here. There are times I've been watching some people, they do something wrong and they know that you caught their attention or, they, or you, they caught your attention and they know that this is wrong. Instead of doing what the Bible has said, confess your faults one to another. After that, pray one for another and they will come to you and they will say, uh, uh, sir, I need prayer. I really need prayer. <laughs> See, you know, I push them forward. I say, what are you praying for? And they say, I'm praying. Just, just pray for me. Just pray for me. They want that prayer to cover the evil thing they are doing. They want that prayer to cover all the bad things they are doing. They want you to overlook that. You know, if we, over, we could overlook that, but it'll, it will hurt you. Because you cannot get to heaven without holiness. No man shall see the Lord. And if we know that you are going astray, and then you are covering it up with prayer, every time you do something wrong, and you think that something might happen to you, and then you quickly come pray for me, that's not the Bible. That's not the Bible. The Bible is confirmed Confess your faults one to another. After that confession and repentance, then pray one for another that she may be healed. Paul the Apostle was so sorry for the Corinthians. In a second Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. And here we're reading from verse 20. Second Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 20. Here it tells us in verse 20, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates and envies and rots and strife and backbitings and whisperings and swelling and tumors, lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many that have sinned already, and I'm not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. He said, this is not just an empty fellowship. This is just, you know, fellowship fellowship just love us just love us of course i love you that's why i'm teaching you the word of god that's why i'm spending even though you are not spending back that's why i'm giving my very life blood that's what paul the apostle is saying but he said you know what the fellowship cannot continue when i come to you i'm going to be well those who have committed fornication or adultery or whatever and they have not repented repentance is important in fellowship we're looking at uh, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 50. Mark chapter 9. We're reading from verse 50. In Mark chapter 9, verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savor, where we shall you season it? Have salt in yourselves 
and uh, tell me the rest tell me out loud a peace one with another by all means let's maintain the peace in the house of god in the assembly of the children of god let there be peace romans chapter 12 romans chapter 12 we're reading from verse 18 romans chapter 12 verse 18 dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is reaching Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, what do you do? Feed him. If he thirst, what do you do? Give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. Don't get angry. Be not overcome of evil. Don't be malicious. Be not overcome of evil. And don't begin to fight and then begin to do something wrong. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil. How? With good. The Lord will grant us wisdom. Second Corinthians chapter 13, we're reading from verse 11. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. You'll be perfect. I said you'll be perfect. I can't hear the people outside. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Can we be of one mind? Can we pull together? Can we walk the same direction? Can we be united? We are already in Jesus' name. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Yeah. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 7. Philippians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 7. In verse 7, it tells us, look at verse 7 here. It says, and the peace of God, peace of God. Look at the last line in verse 9. And the God of peace. You see that in verse 7, the peace of God. And in, the, in verse 9, the God of peace. It says, the peace of God will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you. Then in the middle, see what he's saying. I'm going to read everything now. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart. And minds through Jesus Christ. Finally, brethren, here is what happens in fellowship. Whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are good report. If there be any virtue. If there be any praise. Think on these things. Don't think on negative things. And then it says those things. Which ye have both learned and received and heard. And seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Amen. That peace that surpasses every knowledge, every understanding, will be in your heart. Yeah. Will be in your family. Yeah. Will be among your children. Yeah. Will be in your local church. Yeah. Will be in our church all together in Jesus' name. Yeah. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. The very God of peace, the God of peace, sanctify you holy. Yeah. I thought you'd say, Amen. Yeah. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can God do it? Amen. Faithfully see who has called you, who also will do it. He'll keep us united. Amen. And everything that blocks the unity, that goes against unity and fellowship, it'll take away from our heart and from our families and from our churches in Jesus' name. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Will be with us all. Everything we need to do, everything we need to be so that this peace will reign in our hearts and our lives. It will do it. Even from tonight, it will start in Jesus' name. Faithfully see that has called you. He also will do it. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's take everything we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Is the God of peace? He will grant us peace. Take everything to the Lord in prayer. That you'll be an agent of unity, an agent of fellowship, and a fellowship of the children of God will be better because you are part of us.